Good morning, everybody. This is Kate Warnock, Social Media Manager for Guidewell, coming back to you live from the Meta Future. I'm delighted to have with us today in the Guidewell Insights Lounge, Mr. David Friedman. David, welcome to our interview. Thank you. Great to be here. So David is an author and a contributing um, editor to The Atlantic. And David, you wrote about a year ago a somewhat controversial article called um, How Junk Food Can End Obesity. I'm wondering, with your experience here and in the time that's passed since that time, what is it that the health industry can do to impact population health? Is what, what do you think is the best hope? Well, I think there's pretty widespread agreement at this point that uh, if, if we really want to get the most bang for the buck, then uh, we have to change people's behavior. Uh, as the attention all shifts to chronic disease, then uh, what we have to do is get people to adopt healthier behaviors. And uh, if you want to look at the sweet spot, what's the behavior that most needs to be changed? It's probably getting people to eat in a healthy way. And, and I think the way we need to define healthy eating means in a way that will prevent or mitigate obesity. And that means scientists know exactly how to do that. You have to reduce your caloric intake and burn more calories, exercise more. And I think there are lots of ways, it's a hard problem, there are lots of ways to do it, but I think that the health industry has really locked on to this idea finally that uh, we need to really not just treat people when they're sick, but actually get them at home, at work, and throughout their lives to make healthier choices, especially with regard to food. Well, you know, David, I've, I've looked back along your career. You have, you know, science and medicine is truly at the heart of what you're passionate about. What is it that you see are the trends that are emerging um, in, the, in the medical field or in, in the science field that will really impact consumers moving forward? Uh, well, so uh, first of all, a lot of things are happening, and, and I think it's important to understand uh, that unlike much of what we read in the press these days, there's no one answer to any of these problems, including obesity. Uh, it's really going to take many, many things happening at once to really get the public substantially healthier. But I, I think what we see now in medicine, in science, in the healthcare industry, uh, th there's really a growing recognition of what some of the sort of key pressure points are. And so it's getting people, for example, to be monitored more closely. So we know what they're doing. We know if they're doing unhealthy things, uh, not to police them, but, but to encourage them and nudge them in the right direction. And also to pick up early signs that people may be getting sick. Uh, they're showing the, the first symptoms of especially of chronic disease, but, but of course of any disease. And if we can intervene earlier, best of all if we can prevent, mm -hmm. but, but failing that, uh, look, we're all going to get sick sooner or later. Uh, and, and if we can pick up the earliest signs and intervene uh, far, far sooner in the cycle, uh, not only will costs go down, but outcomes will go way, way up. Really, most of us these days really should be living into our 80s and with a high quality of life. I mean, that's really important, uh, that we enjoy life, uh, if possible, into our 80s and even beyond. Well, I think part of the role that you play, um, at least through your Twitter feed, is you really like to curate what scientific studies are being conducted and what their mm. findings are. And you regularly tweet about how sometimes those findings or those studies could be misleading. How is it that the regular consumer, you yourself are highly educated in this field, how is it that someone who's interested in staying informed can make the right choices and kind of de determine what's, what's hype and what's real? It, that is such a hard problem, and uh, so there's no easy answer to that question. But you know, one thing I really like to emphasize is that I feel science journalism has really miserably failed us when it comes to personal health. And, and the problem is there are many, many scientific studies conducted all the time, thousands and thousands of them all over the world about any question you could possibly imagine relating to health and eating and exercise. And it's very, very hard to do these studies. And the result is we get a lot of bad answers. In fact, studies have found, scientists agree, that most studies published on health end up being wrong. 
And, and the problem is science journalists tend to lock in to what seem to be the most interesting studies, the studies they know readers will really be excited about. And typically those are studies that appear to offer very simple solutions to complicated problems. And of course we love hearing that. But those solutions are almost always wrong. So we hear things like, oh, just cut carbs, or it's all in our gut bacteria, or eat natural foods, don't eat foods from big companies. Some of these things may be helpful, but none of them are solutions. And I think what consumers need to do is look beyond what journalists tell them. Don't pay too much attention to what's going on in the media, but use it as an invitation to Google stuff. It's really easy to do these days. You can go and see for yourself what scientists are saying. And instead of locking on to any one study or any one scientist, and especially locking on to what a journalist says, and I'm a journalist, don't take my word for anything, uh, what we should do is see what most scientists are saying. And if you look at the long-standing, sort of widely agreed upon opinions of scientists, it's not always right, but in most cases you'll be in, in pretty good shape. What I try to do as a science journalist is tell people what most scientists are saying and avoid locking on to those few studies. So that's what I would ask people to watch out for. You know, just, just as a, a side question for you, you know, I'm wondering if some of those studies that you, you purport to be you know, misleading, is it because the way they structured their study doesn't really reflect a very wide population? You know, do we tend to kind of carve out or you know, just buy, maybe they don't have the right funding or you know, the, the longitudinal studies just get cut short? Um, you know, what is it that we can do to kind of perhaps change how studies are, are funded or, or constructed so that it really does yield the kind of results that you know they're investing their time and their resources into it. We want to get the best information back. Is there a consumer way to influence how that is done or you know is that simply an academic problem? Uh, it's both. Uh, I think there are ways that probably we all in the public can put some pressure on, on the world of science to actually give us practical information uh, that, uh, that doesn't mislead us. But, but here's the real problem. Uh, science is messy. Science is really hard. These are very, very difficult, complicated questions. And what science tries to do is pin down and isolate particular aspects of a problem. That doesn't work very well with biology because we're very, very complicated systems. It's hard to look at any one piece of it and get a clear answer. So a lot of the, the trouble really is just inherent to the science itself. So we shouldn't be saying, wow, what's wrong with those scientists? Are they corrupt? Are they stupid? None of that. They're brilliant. Most of them are very, very dedicated, very high integrity. It's just the nature of the beast. And we have to understand that and not pay attention to any one study, but try to take a look at the broad field of studies, especially those that have been coming up with roughly the same answer for many, many years, such as if you want to lose weight, you're going to have to control your calories, and you're going to have to burn more. We've known that forever. There's never been any change in the science there. So let's stick to that one and avoid some of the faddish solutions we hear about. Well, I think that's a, a great lead into my next question for you. So we had Esther Dice here yesterday, the founder of Hiccup, and she has launched this fascinating program called The Way to Wellville and taken five cities from around the nation who already had programs in place that she felt just needed to be brought to the next level as far as improving their cities or their environments popular or population health. Do you find that, you know, that's real world application of, you know, how do we improve, how do we motivate, how do we get people to be accountable for their own health? Is a program like that scalable? Once we find the results of that, do you think that that's, you know, will she come up with results that can be applied everywhere, or what are your thoughts on that? Well, there are a lot of things I, I love about the Wellville project. It, it, I think it's terrific because it is real world, and one of the problems we have is that when you put people in a study, 
they don't behave the way they do in the real world. In the real world, we're influenced by many, many things. The first thing you do when you put people in a study is you ask them, for example, to track their weight and track what they're eating. Well, right away, you've made a big change in their behavior. Most people don't do that. So we want to know how people behave in the real world. And the Wellville Project really looks at a normal community, uh, a typical community, and will take all the environmental prompts and cues and rewards that we get in daily life and take a look how we can make some changes that really, really work, including getting food producers, the big food companies, to make some healthier products because they're capable of it uh, and, and they're already trying. So there's nothing not to love about this project. Now, will it scale up? That's a marketing problem. I mean, that's, that's changing the opinion of the American public. It's very hard to do. No one knows how to do that. Uh, but, but we have to keep trying, and I think uh, the Wellville uh, project is one that should get some attention, and it will be just one more thing that will maybe slightly move the needle in what the public sees and thinks, and we need just lots of things like that. So uh, I don't think the Wellville project will itself make a huge difference in what the public thinks, but I think it'll be one really important step. And, and as we do more and more of it, I think we will actually start to see people uh, change their opinions and their behaviors. And fortunately, I think, you know, just like the Wellville Five how already had some structure in place where people were trying to, you know, government agencies or, or nonprofits were working in unison. I think that you have that sort of that approach is, is taken across many cities. I know here in Florida there's a very active community of people, mm. you know, a blend of policymakers to, you know, folks working with uh, you know, trying to, to you know correct healthcare disparities. You know, I think that there's a lot of, there's a strong appetite. And so with something like Wellville, if we can, you know, take their their findings and give it to these these people who are already working at that grassroots level, we'll have that kind of success too. So yeah, I think you're right. And, and let's let's hope that's exactly what happens. Hopefully. Yeah. So, well, David, it was delightful talking with you here today in the Guideville Insights Lounge. I really hope that you enjoy your second day of being here and look forward to reading more of your content in the future. So this is Kate Warnock coming to you live. We'll be back shortly.